Yeah. Yes, sir. Yep. <laughs> Makes it harder to see the audience, so I don't get nervous. <laughs> So, are you introducing me? I'm introducing you. Okay. Welcome. I'm Nathan from Arms Armor and the Oakshot Institute, and we are very happy to have you all here tonight for our fantastic guest lecturer, Jess Finley, who is arguably the world's most famous swordswoman. After Wonder Woman. <laughs> <laughs> the real and, and but I only wrote more. the book on medieval wrestling and a strong contrib contributor to our knowledge about a whole bunch of different kinds of medieval stuff. So please welcome her. tonight um, and as Nathan said I'm I'm Jess Finley um, I'm an independent researcher in a lot of a lot of areas whatever piques my interest at the time um, and um, so yes I I have studied uh, medieval swordsmanship uh, which includes for me armor wrestling horses all that stuff um, since about 2003 was the first seminar I took, so a, a good bit of time. Uh, before that, I was in Renaissance festivals, and I was like 18 and very poor. So if I wanted to have my uh, costume to perform with swords on stage at Renaissance festivals, I had to make them. And so that is part of the way I ended up getting into also knowing a little bit about what was happening with the clothes. So just like with the swords, my interest began in stage and theatrics and performing things and then morphed over into what was the history behind these ideas, um, what was real, what wasn't real. Um, my original period of interest was 16th century um, Scots and Irish stuff. So if you want to geek out about that sometime, hit me up. But uh, I, I, once I started studying um, Lichtenauer's art, the German Hema or German medieval martial arts, um, I had to slide back into the 15th century to get into the stuff that I really wanted to there. So um, that's mostly what we're going to be talking about today is, is broadly 15th century ideas. So those you're going to see some of them go a little early, some of them a little late, because there aren't that many fabric examples out there in the world for us to work with. So we're going to talk about um, five garments that I feel like I know enough about to talk about. Um, I have seen, well, let's see, I'll say this. Uh, the Lübeck, uh, Waffenrock is in Lübeck, Germany, um, and I got to go uh, examine, uh, record, and eventually write a paper on and get published on that particular garment, um, and I've made this reproduction here. So I have a lot of firsthand knowledge of that one, both of the making um, and of what the original felt like in my literal hands, so that's really cool. Um, the, the Charles VI coat armor, um, some of you may know uh, Tasha Kelly in Chicago. She is the expert on that piece, um, but she and I have rapped a lot about it. Um, and I've done some, done some work on some repros and building off of her research, so, um, so I think that'll be fun to talk about. Uh, the Charles de Bois, Purpoint. Um, we're going to talk about that style of purpoint. Um, I haven't gotten to see that one. Uh, it's kind of hard to get to see. Um, but uh, that's really, really good to talk about as far as tailoring and some really intricate stuff. And people really dig it, right? It's pretty iconic. Um, the Rothwell Jack, I haven't seen. It's in England. Can't remember which place it's at right now, but that's OK. Um, it's in England. Um, but it is a really nice example we're going to talk about because um, of its method of construction. And finally, the Vesta Coburg hunting armor. Um, and, and I just chose that because those are the most complete pieces. But there are many, many examples of, um, of uh, fabric armor being made of 
thousands of islands, right? And I've seen a couple of those in person um, and done some work with that on my own. So uh, the Lubeck Wapenrock, Waffenrock, I have a hard time saying it, um, is, can we, can we click a couple of times? I'm gonna have some text coming up. About there, one more, one more, one more. No, and we're back. <laughs> <laughs> so we might have to do that on these because I tried to get them to propagate, but then they didn't do it. So, um, so uh, we're gonna jump into kind of how these are made so you guys can understand that there's a wide variety of ways they're made. Um, and then what I want to do is kind of wrap up fairly quickly so that we can go into Q&A about what you guys want to know about these things because I didn't know who my audience would be and so I wasn't quite sure how to, how to go about it. But uh, let's talk about it. So the, the way that this garment is made, um, my repo is there. Um, incidentally, that repo is the original size and everything of, of the original. So that one's worth, worth having a look at. Um, it had five layers to make it up. On the exterior is a fustian, so that is a, a linen and cotton woven fabric, right? So the linen threads go one way, the cotton threads go the other way, um, and it's actually a really specific uh, broken twill so that um, on one side of the fabric only the linen threads stick out and on the other side only the cotton threads stick out, right? And then they brushed the heck out of the cotton side so it was velvety and soft and lovely, right? Um, it was used for shirts and underwear, right? So this is cheap stuff in the time and place. These days, you have to have it woven if you want it. So that's, that sucks, but that's the way it is. Um, so you have this fustian on the exterior layer. Um, then there's a heavy, heavy linen, right? So just like a linen, almost like a canvas, right? Just a plain woven linen that's easily to get a hold of. Raw cotton, heavy linen again, and the fustian again. And since I said the fustian has kind of a fuzzy side and a linen side, they were put the same direction. So on the exterior of that garment, which we'll let you guys take off and play with later, uh, all the linen is on the outside, right? For that durability where you need it. Um, where it's rubbing against your armor or maybe it's getting hit by other weaponry. Um, and on the inside is that fuzzy nice cotton, right? To soak up sweat or whatever, right? Or they just liked it being on the inside, hard to know. Um, the exterior of the garment was painted um, with a very simple paint. Um, we had a chemically, the original chemically tested. And so it was just linseed oil and carbon, right? Um, really, really simple black paint. If you look at 15th century, um, 15th century books for, for artists, they, they talk about how you can do this. So you can get proportions um, from Cennini or, or there's a few English writers um, that you can get these proportions from to make up your paint, but it's very, very simple and straight, straightforward to do. And then uh, it was quilted through all of the layers. Right, so sometimes we think, are these things, did you quilt and then stuff? And the answer is no. Um, on none of the examples is that done. So that's not really, I'm not gonna say it's not a period technique, but we don't have any, right? <laughs> so, so that's worth knowing. Um, with a slight maybe, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, next slide, please. Um, so when, uh, when I was trying to figure out how the heck did you quilt through three inches or more of cotton and get these perfectly straight radial lines. Uh, the answer is always tooling. I'm sure you guys are, are craftspeople and makers and so you know tools are always the answer to get good results. Um, and I looked around for, for what medieval tools I could find that might uh, suit the bill and um, really some sort of twin vice seemed to be the answer to me that I could, I could compress that cotton, get a straight line to run my needle down, and sew very, very quickly. And so uh, I ended up making up this tool, um, just custom for what I thought I needed, and, uh, and I brought that to show you guys so you can handle that a little bit later. Next slide. Uh, the other thing is, oh boy, oh boy, please use a sailmaker's palm if you're gonna be doing this kind of work, right? Um, 
So, so some people like to try to use maybe like a very thin awl where they'll punch a hole and then they'll put the needle through and then they'll pull. And, and you can do that, but boy, that's a whole lot of steps um, and tools that you're picking up and putting down constantly and that just eats just too much time. Um, so sail makers palms um, are easily bought, uh, you know, off of wherever. Um, sail maker tools can be found online. Um, but they go clear through the medieval period, and as best we can tell, they're basically identical uh, to the medieval versions. Um, they also sell nice, beautiful, heavy, uh, heavy needles, which you're unlikely to snap, though sometimes you will. Um, excellent. Next up. So uh, the Lindsay Dorlin carbon, uh, when I made this, because I was it was maybe my, this was my third version, but I was still like not feeling really confident about the process of making. Um, I decided to go ahead and quilt everything because I wanted it to be exactly like the original, so I'd do all these measurements and all this stuff, right? So I quilted everything and then painted it, right? Because I didn't trust myself to figure it out the other way, right? But going forward, it's absolutely better to do it the other way, right? If you're not trying to meet make something uh, exacting uh, to something that exists. So uh, when I painted this, um, many of you probably know linseed oil has a very distinctive smell and it takes a very long time to dry, especially when you're working with the raw version, right? Which as far as we know, that's what was in the paint because nothing else turned up in it. So uh, I painted this all on. It soaked into it, soaked into the cotton and I think it off gas for six months, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. And uh, my partner at the time still hates the smell of Lindsay Dora. <laughs> um, but yeah, so when, uh, when you, if I were to do it again, uh, and, and I have, there's an example here for you to see, uh, I found it's much easier once I understand how to create these things to go ahead and just paint it on just the fustian, right? And then I can toss that in the oven, dry it real quick, and then sew, right? And, and it gets ahead of all of these problems. All right. Uh, so yeah, all right, click, click, because I was telling you about the thing, so. Um, so when you're looking at creating these garments, yeah, yeah, um, kind of the, the process that I came across was that you're gonna cut your pattern pieces. Um, and for this garment, the interior and the exterior are very different shapes as, as referenced in that little image there. If you wanna know more about that, I published on it. Boy Dollar Brewer, go, go find that article. Um, then you can paint your exterior and dry it. <laughs> you're gonna assemble each uh, quadrant. We can click one more time, there'll be a picture. Assemble each quadrant kind of like a pillow, if that makes sense. So your interior layers, your exterior layers, you stuff everything, and then you get to smash it and quilt your channels um, using a tool or not, as you wish. Um, and then finally, you would assemble all of the quadrants together. So when I made this, one of the problems I ran into is it isn't quite as robust as the original. So part of that could be time, right? The sucker is, however old, 600 years old. Maybe the, the textile quality of the cotton has changed, maybe. Or maybe they got it thicker than I could. And <clears throat> this wasn't something I had thought of, nor was I brave enough to do with this version. Um, but now I know you can wet down the cotton and the garment, smash it all down, and then shove a whole bunch more in those holes. And then once it all dries, the cotton comes back, right? So you have both that you have quilted through cotton and also this incredibly thick, stiff, robust stuffing afterwards. So that gets you the best of both worlds. Did they do that? I don't know, but I bet they thought of that too. Um, and it certainly solves uh, some of the problems that I, I encountered when, when recreating these things. So we can go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I was talking about. And then I dried in the oven at 170 degrees. Because really, uh, I, in all of this experimentation, got over the fact 
that I didn't have to wait for things to dry. They had fires. They always said, set it by the fire to dry. I have an oven. <laughs> things are going in the oven, right? It just gets it done in a day instead of a week. So, uh, but be careful with your temperatures. Cotton burns really well. Um, <laughs> ask me how I know. <laughs> so, uh, the Charles VI coat armor. So this is uh, what we call Red Charlie, I mentioned. Uh, Tasha Dandelion and Kelly's article um, on that. Please look that up. She is the expert on that. She is local-ish to you. I mean, from my perspective. So talk to her about it, right? Um, if you get more questions. But, as I said, I'm, I'm super interested in this garment. So this one, um, she figures fit a six-year-old boy. That's about how big it is. So it's this tiny little thing. Um, and this sample here, would be the front half, and that's the size of the original, right? So this is for a tiny, tiny kid, right? Um, so we can move on. Um, so it kind of has a unique makeup compared to the others um, in that it's made of two halves. So there's like an exterior padded section and an interior padded section, right? Which I have cut away here so you guys can kind of jive on how weird this thing is. Um, and uh, the two sections are made as mirrors of one, each other, uh, of one another and then put together, right? And the silk is applied to the, just the outside, right? Um, but it's linen and cotton again. Um, we're gonna see that come up time and time again. Um, we're ready to click. Um, I said they didn't quilt and stuff, right? They, they didn't, but what's curious about this one is that it is quilted through only the fa fabric, so let, we'll talk about what they maybe did. Um, next piece. Um, so these quilt lines encase the cotton and help create the sheath of this garment and, and give it that nice round chest, right, that everyone's looking for in this thin tucked waist, right? And, um, and each of these halves, each of these halves is D-shaped in that like this inside section is more or less straight, it's hard to see. Um, and so all of the padding is going to one side. Does that make sense? Okay, awesome, you guys are smiling. <laughs> Smiles and nods, all right. <laughs> so, <clears throat> This is Tasha working on trying to figure out how the heck to do this, right? Because she saw the original, got to study, and got to do all the stuff. She knows what was done, but she doesn't know how it was done, right? Um, so what she worked with was uh, laying her, what would be her, her flat linen on, on a frame, like an embroidery frame, but just a big version of it, um, drawing out her whole pattern and then laying her cotton down in these tubes and then stretching the fabric over and working one at a time. If you can imagine that, right? So what problems she, uh, it might be the next one if we click. Yeah, yes, yeah, so we'll skip that, we'll come back to that, right? So she said um, she found it really difficult again to get the cotton to the density that she felt on the original, right? Because it wasn't, it probably wasn't stuffed from either end, because that doesn't really make sense. Like, how are you gonna make a bubble and then stuff it in, right? Because they, each channel changes its thickness as it runs down, right? So it couldn't have really been done that way. Um, and I'll just pass that sucker around, let's just do that. Um, and so, um, yeah, so she, she made a beautiful reproduction, it's incredible, um, but she was like, yeah, it's just not as thick. It's just not as thick, it's not as stiff. I couldn't work it out. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, we're gonna click for a minute. We're gonna click for a minute. There we go. Um, so, having figured out that you can make cotton wet and change its properties, I started screwing around with what could I do with that idea. And so I started like making a layer of cotton that was the same thickness, wetting it down, and then rolling it into a really, really tight tube, and then uh, 
you can kind of see here, kind of changing how it's rolling it almost like clay so that there were skinny sections and thick sections, right? Can you imagine that? Like if you're rolling a clay snake, mm -hmm. you can get a skinny section and a fat section. So <clears throat> once I did that to make this sample, then I quilted over it while it was still wet, which meant that I could pull that really tight and it had nowhere to expand to. So the, the compression of, of cotton, like when you fluff it up to get it all nice um, and the same density, and then you get it wet. Um, on my one, my one uh, sample I did of it, I went from 15 liters to three liters. So that's how much it, how much you can compress, right? With it wet, and then it comes back to 10. So since I stitched over this while it was wet, it's always trying to get back to a bigger size than it can get to. And then you get this resilience, this feel um, that is maybe getting closer. Again, we can't prove they did it, but, um, but there's a lot of cool things you can do uh, once, you're, once you're messing with, with fibers and getting them wet. All right. So again, um, we can just kind of click through here. It's gonna look the same as that previous one, but I would roll up this wet cotton, form it into this tube, kind of flatten the tube out because I, you mentioned those D shapes earlier, so I want a flat side. Um, then I inserted it in between the fabrics on my frame um, and stretched it over and started quilting along. You can see the wetness transferring through to the linen, right? Um, repeat for all of the tubes over and over and over, right? <laughs> and, then, and then you would uh, go ahead and dry it off of the frame. So I went ahead and cut it off and dried it. Um, if we can go to the next slide, I think, yep. And so I went ahead and played with, would it matter if I dried it around a form? Could I stretch it around a form and like make it get that chest better? It kind of worked, it was kind of cool. Eh. It seems to fall apart after a little bit, right? So it doesn't retain it. Um, but for a little bit, it looked really <coughs> sweet. So if I were gonna put something in my shop window, you better bet I would have done that, right? <laughs> to hang it up, because it looks real nice for a little bit. Um, so I dried that in the oven at 180 degrees for three hours. Um, that was too hot, so darkening of the linen was observed. <laughs> <laughs> all right, and so once it's all done, once you've finished uh, all of your pieces individually, then we would go ahead and put it together and stitch the silk to the outside um, after everything is dried and we have no concerns about the silk getting ruined in any of the processing. Um, and that also meant that when I'm doing all the interior work, I can have ugly fast stitches that don't really matter. The only stitches that matter are the ones on the outside that people can see through the silk. So only one time did I have to do pretty, pretty stitches, right? I don't know if that's observed in the original because they didn't let her cut it apart to look at the insides, <laughs> right? But I would imagine so from what I know of medieval work, they would have saved time where they could. Thank you. So the Charles Blois, um, it's very famous. Probably all of you are, are somewhat familiar with it. Um, we can click, there's a couple. Um, the presumed layers we have here are silk linen, cotton linen, and fine linen on the inside. Um, it, uh, it was probably quilted through all the layers. Uh, the best research I can tell, they're not sure if the stitching we're seeing is original or not. It could be reproduction stitching that we're looking at or conservation stitching that we're looking at. Um, it does certainly fit the aesthetic of the time. So I'm gonna guess it's original, but I've heard some debate about that. So who knows, who knows. Um, so these are regularly quilted, meaning that uh, as opposed to these thicker, thicker quilted garments, they weren't trying to force all the padding to one side or the other, right? It's just nice and flat, just stitch through everything. So those would be regular fisheye shapes if you were to cut through them. Um, and then there's that fancy grand assayette sleeve, however you say that, because French is not my language. Um, and a lot of people talk about that being for mobility, right? Excellent, thank you. Um, so we can just jump through there. Um, so one of the things you're thinking about with this is how we're gonna get this fashionable shape. 
Um, that garment might have been for civilian use as much as for military use, right? Um, then as now, um, military fashion bleeds over into, into civilian fashion, right? Um, so it, that could have just been a tuxedo, uh, and, and that's entirely possible. Um, that being said, trying to get that shape, whether it's Under Armour or not, um, could certainly be done through kind of like the corseting action of the garment itself. Um, some people have made thickly padded uh, fronts to try to get that shape, but we don't see that in the original of that particular garment, right? So that shape is being provided by the tailoring alone, right? That being said, you could always add more quilt lines, right? So if you want something to be stiffer and to have more internal coherence, you put more quilt lines closer and closer and closer, right? And that will change the, the feel of the garment from something that feels like fabric to something that feels like leather to something that feels like dry clay, right? And, and it just depends on, on how much quilting you're willing to do realistically. Um, next up. So uh, when we're looking at that Grand Assayette, um, this is, uh, this is from, I cannot remember the gentleman's name, doesn't matter. Um, when the garment was studied and measured some, some long time ago, he took a pattern of it. You can find this on the internet, anywhere and everywhere. Um, and so you see that just for the upper sleeve, there's a whole lot of pattern pieces there, right? It's a pretty complex garment. And <laughs> the part I want to draw your attention to for today's discussion is really that triangle up the top, that ABC triangle. Um, and on the sleeve, doo -doo -doo -doo, if I were to be wearing this one, that triangle is right here on the chest, okay? So what that ends up doing um, is creating, you guys see how it stands out by itself. It creates this bulbous shape in and of itself. So if you can quilt your, your version of this garment um, with enough quilt lines or enough cotton or a sweet mix in between, you have the potential of creating that shape just from the patterning itself, right? So I'll pass that around. Um, and likewise, the, uh, the way he's drawn it here, it's a very even, even curve, do you, you see what I'm trying to say? It's kind of a quarter of a circle, not quite a quarter. Um, but you can play with, and I have played with, changing the shape of that, and that's gonna move it from being a bulb down here to being a bulb up here to being a bulb out here, depending on how you shape just that gore, right? And so as you see that fashion change over the later part of the 14th century, you can kind of follow that they might have just been tweaking just that one little piece, right? You didn't have to relearn the whole garment, potentially. Um, I see the armor is like, this makes sense. <laughs> 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 um, incidentally, Craig, what we were talking about earlier about the shaping of the upper arm, this little guy right here, the way it cuts in there, gives that tight right here before it comes back out. It's really cool, so. Uh, we were just noticing on one of the uh, upper arm armors in the Oakshot collection that there, there's some really particular shaping to the upper arm that, that we see in these garments. It's really cool. I was jazzed. All right, we're going to go to the next. Skip, skip, skip. I'm just showing where all those scenes are. All right, so I pulled it on the vise. Why? Because once you have a tool and you get really good at it, you just keep wanting to use it. So this is my hammer. I use it on everything. Um, but again, it's very helpful. Uh, in this case, I didn't really need it to compress this because as you guys are gonna see, it's not super thick, but it is really nice to have a third hand. So I could have both of my hands to sew and to deal with all the things you're dealing with, uh, with this kind of garment and not having to worry about holding the garment in place itself, right? So, uh, so I did quilt it on the vise. Okay, go ahead. And so you can see here when this guy was when this guy was fresh, 
how that front chest piece just starts to take its shape all by itself, right? And it's just standing up. All right, next up. And so you can go through this real quick. So if you're gonna make something like this, I would cut out all of my pattern pieces, and we can keep going, um, and assemble each section. Um, layer in your cotton for each, each area into that pillow again, right? And then we're gonna quilt through um, all of the layers to create our channels and then finally assemble the, the garment in total. So this is one I made for Scott Wilson, if any of you guys know him down at Darkwood Armory. Um, I got really excited about, can I turn this into armor? Because it's Scott Wilson, right? He doesn't want a tux, he wants armor. Uh, so I probably took this idea too far because um, there is not a human in that garment on the ground, and that's the way it laid there, right? <laughs> um, but it, again, it was a proof in concept. I wanted to see, is this true? Could I do this? Could I make it take the shape without there being a pillow on the chest? And yeah, you can. You can. All right, so next up. So the Rothwell Jack. Boy, I hope to get to see this soon. Um, so this is in England. Um, and uh, I know about it from, from published research. So it uh, is made slightly differently than everything else. It's made like a layer cake, right? It is like your, your baklava of, of armor. Um, so you would take linen and carded wool and then linen and then carded wool and then linen and carded wool. Um, so there were 11 layers total uh, in the front, nine in the back quilting through all of that, and then it was lined in a double layer of linen. Um, it's it's uh, obviously in bad shape, you guys. You can see that so much of it is missing. Um, we can keep going, thank you. Um, but it is interesting that a lot of these garments uh, do seem to be sleeveless and collarless, right? And, but it does make sense. When you're thinking about fabric armor, right, and it's gonna have some thickness and some, um, um, well, thickness, yeah. I guess that's what I, all I need to say about it. It's really, really hard to do good armpits, good elbows, right? Good neck movement once you start putting all of that stuff in. So you're gonna solve that problem with some other garment or combination of garments. Um, and when you're thinking about fabric armor as, as true standalone armor, it's a breast and back weight, right? You're, you've got other pieces to handle the other finicky bits. All right. Um, it closes through only four pair of violets, which certainly implies a breastplate was worn over it, right? Um, and so jacks come up uh, all the time in literature, way more in literature than exist in the world, right? Um, this guy is in Philly. Um, I haven't managed to get myself in there to see him, but he's covered in a layer of, uh, of leather and that comes up in writing quite frequently, right? That these jacks of layers and layers and layers of linen um, would often have an exterior of, of like a buckskin, right? A soft leather. Um, and even though the couple of examples that we have here are pretty uh, shapeless, right? They're pretty, pretty square and boxy looking. Um, Charles Lynn here on the right, uh, I think that one was 35 layers of linen, he went ahead and just said, can I make it fashionable, right? Does it have to be a box? It doesn't have to be a box, right? If, if you're willing to, willing to figure out the tailoring on it, which, which he is. Um, and so the last idea we wanna look into is the, uh, the doublets of holes, right? Um, and so this example of this picture is in uh, Vestacober. Uh, it is a suite of hunting armor. And so there is this, uh, I mean, we'll just call it a doublet for a man. Um, as you see, this is later period. You guys can tell that just glancing at it. Um, but not only is there his armor, but there's armor for all of his dogs, <laughs> right? Which is nice. super cool. Um, and I would want if I were hunting boar. <laughs> uh, so go ahead and click through on that, thank you. Um, so these are made of two layers of, of a heavy linen twill, 
Um, the eyelets go through both layers, right? And we know it's twill because if you can kind of see like on the edges, there, there aren't holes there, right? Mm -hmm. And so you can see what the, what the fabric is on the edges. Um, it is sleeveless and collarless as it is, but it appears to me to have been cut. So who knows what would have been there? Maybe a short collar, maybe little, little catlets like you might see, you know, in the late 16th century. Hard to know. All right. Um, yes. So there are a few examples of eyeleted doublets in the world. There's one in Bern, which I got to see. Um, and the one in Bern, uh, all of the edges, including like the construction seams, were all cut, like all cut through the eyelets. So I feel like that kind of implies there might have been people producing yardage of eyeleted fabric, right? That you could just buy and then cut your stuff out of, right? But the Vesta Coburg was obviously made in pieces. <clears throat> uh, I am working on one for myself. Um, and the trick with, if you're trying to have nice finished edges, is as you're making all of these holes and doing these eyelets, it starts to shrink everything. And it doesn't necessarily shrink it in the same direction uh, vertically and horizontally, depending on how you're stacking the holes, right? So some weird things could happen. So I totally get why somebody would be like, can I just buy a few yards of that? And then I know I'm gonna have the right size garment. Um, I did uh, some test samples, they're around here somewhere. I did some test samples so I understood the shrinkage I was gonna encounter. Um, and plus, I had read someone who had attempted one years and years ago on the internet who got through the body just to realize it had shrunk out of their size because they hadn't noticed the shrinkage happening. And they were rather devastated. So, um, so yeah, so beware of that if you go to this. Um, so one of the questions that often comes up is, is do these have uh, metal uh, in all of the eyelets? In one of the garments, as you can see over there, uh, yes, they did. Um, the rest of them, no, that are extant. So it was done, but it was not always done, right? And again, the ones in Bern and, and the places in Vesta Coburg, it's cut through, right? We'd know if there were, you know, if there was metal rings in there. So, um, so yeah, this is this is the close up of Vesta Coburg. You see how neat and tidy uh, that is. The one up top I just saw this summer in France, it's in the uh, Musée de l'Armée. It's another dog armor. And that person had no pride in their work. <laughs> um, but feel free to get sloppy with this stuff, right? Again, medieval people did, so it's totally fine. Um, and then I suspect that, you know, for, for us sword nerds, which I think is most of you um, out there, uh, one of the Telhoffer manuscripts includes this image um, as part of the kit of a knight. And that is not his mail, because that's his mail, right? So that's something else. Is it one of these? Maybe, I hope so. I'm pretending it is, because I'm making one. All right. <laughs> Next up. So these are the, the five garments I wanted to talk to you about briefly that, that are definitely probably armor. Um, they're all made very differently, um, but they share, they share some ideas, and that is in their construction, they are protecting us through either many, 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 many layers in the idea of a jack, or through incredibly thick padding, thick cottons, right? Um, and then finally, through the uh, frequency of quilting, right? Because that frequency of quilting, much like the frequency of the holes, changes the feel and the tactile uh, resilience of, of fabric, right? And so as you look around, you can start uh, paying attention to extant garments you can see on the internet and start to see like, oh yeah, like in this, this Italian thing, like on the collar, like there, there's a quilt line every quarter inch, right? I bet that sucker is stiff and stands up and like 
is, you know, real, real stout, right? Um, versus, I don't know, sometimes, uh, like there's a Melling painting where a guy has like pillows, right? It looks like a, like a, like a regular diamond shaped quilting, right? And you see that and you go, I bet that's something with thick. It had to be thick with cotton because the quilting is so far apart. The only reason it could work as armor is if it was thick, right? So uh, I, I hope this was some brief <laughs> information uh, that you found useful and I am happy to go in whatever direction you guys want for Q&A um, about wearing them, using them. I kind of cut on this one, you know, whatever you guys want to talk about. So thank you so much. mostly curious if this is something that spans all of the medieval period or if you think oh yeah, yeah yeah okay so well what we can say there are quilted garments going back forever sure right basically like in Egypt right um, so quilted armors that we have extant right these guys show up I like 1360s right and, and they, they are probably earlier too but like extant um, uh, the Waffenrock is 1440 to 1460. It's a very specific look, right? Um, and then the Rothwell jacket and the Vesta Coburg stuff is later, right? So that's getting into 16th century, 17th century, right? And, and of course we didn't go into like buff coats and other sorts of sure. things either, but yeah. Do you think the um, social status affected this greatly? Were, were your common soldiers working on their own or their wives doing it for them and it's gonna be simpler and that and then like the Charles the, the Right. Yeah, six is yeah. gonna be. Right, well alive. it's tricky, like this, two of those are for like, definitely for nobility, right? right? So those are obviously being produced by, by a professional of, of some kind. Um, the Lubeck examples, um, there are actually two in Lubeck, um, and they are made for very different sized men, but they're absolutely coming out of the same workshop, right? Like that they have the exact same number of flutes in the back, even though they had to tweak them to fit two different sized people, right? <laughs> so, and they were hanging up together for like 600 years, right? Yeah. Um, so that's obviously some sort of industrial creation, like almost uniform, yeah. right? Armor. Armor. Yes. Yeah. Right. But but could could somebody uh, somebody's wife have made the Rothwell jack? Sure. Yeah. Um, those boxy ones wouldn't have taken much um, specialist knowledge to do, I don't think. Patience and effort. Yeah, patience and effort. Mm -hmm. Did you see the art where you see the? You know, it's always the guards and the soldiers, right? Yeah. Kind of thing. You're like, those are probably not getting top of the line, bespoke. Correct. Right. right. And I think, I think a lot of these, um, I think a lot of these could fit a lot of bodies, right? Other than maybe the gloss, right? That's very, very tailored. Um, but but the rest of them, you know. Like I said, this is the this is the size that was uh, of the smaller one um, in Lubeck, and I made it, and then I was like, "Oh shit, it fits me." <laughs> I guess I'm wearing it, <laughs> right? So, yeah. Yeah, uh, a couple of questions from the chat. I'll combine a few for you. Uh, have you, or do you know of anyone who's ever tested blades against these cloth armors? And oh, what the results? <laughs> and um, could you also comment on the differences in mobility for these examples? Oh, yeah. And your own experiences with that. Lovely. Um, yes. 
hitting them with sharp things. I have done a ton of, um, both personally and invited friends to do. Uh, I don't have them here, but I do have this one. What did we hit this with? Uh, we hit this with some long swords, and then we broke out a sharp messer. And the messer liked to cut it more than the long sword did. Um, but uh, yeah, and so what I found, a sample I made of, uh, of the Lubeck the back, um, we, I had it at an event I invited everybody to have at. Um, and again, the messer was the only thing that got through it. Lots of things cut the exterior, but didn't make it all the way through the cotton. But y'all, a rondelle dagger just ruins any fabric armor, period. Hands down, <laughs> amen, right? So if you wanna get through armor, just thrust the guy. Like, just just thrust the guy. Don't don't cut it. So did you find, so when we were doing similar tests, yeah. we found one of the interesting things we found was that square section spikes oh. did not penetrate cloth armor as well as well it just kind of bound mm -hmm. the fabric yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but sharp daggers went straight yeah. through it right? yeah yeah and yeah. then the only cuts that we found that went through were with extraordinarily sharp and thin right well, so we had otherwise to just really hard it. and really hard like yeah. harder than you'd ever be able to pull off on anybody that's a fighter well yeah. they could be facing the other way <laughs> 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 you know, kind of. um, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I mean, that basically aligns aligns with what I have found. Um, is is yeah. You know, uh, I the first time I thrust one of those guys, um, I was like with my sharp rondel, which isn't that sharp. Like I don't maintain my stuff very well because I use it right. So whatever. But um, it certainly was not kitchen knife sharp by any stretch of the imagination. But I was like, all right, I'm gonna get through this. Here we go, here we go, here we go. Cacao! And then I was like, oh, I felt nothing. Yeah. Like I expected to, cause I had sewn the darn thing and I knew how, <laughs> how much I had done this on it, right? But you know, uh, sharp weapons do what sharp weapons do. Um, but you know, to your idea, um, there's certainly something there that certain shapes do seem to bind um, particularly in the cotton, they get caught up in it. Yeah. Um, and also when the cotton is damp, I don't want to say wet, but when it's damp, it seems to catch more. Mm -hmm. And so I half wonder if like part of the advantage besides obviously bludgeoning, but when you have something that thick, like you're going to sweat on the inside a little bit. And I kind of wonder if that isn't like a feature, not a bug, <laughs> right? I mean, I don't know. It seems weird. So to that point, a lot of these include cotton. Yeah, yeah. And I wasn't really aware there was that much. I wasn't aware that cotton was that common as a, a garment, but obviously as an armor, it has some advantages that other textiles don't. Do you think that? Yeah. Was, I mean, you're implying that that was a common feature. Yeah. And experience you start to sweat inside all the gear. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, hey, I'll just make an armor layer that does better when I'm sweating because I'm gonna be doing that. Right? Good choice. Yeah, yeah. I don't I mean I don't know. That's it's a ridiculous thought, but it's a thought I've had. You know, who knows? Um but yeah, no, there was plenty of cotton. There was a huge cotton industry uh coming in as early as like eleven hundred, right? It's all coming through Italy from the Middle East, yeah. Egypt, etc. Um, it, it's getting processed in Italy and Germany. Um, it's most often used in conjunction with linen. Um, it, as far as a fabric goes, like 100% cotton fabrics obviously came in later as like a high, high fashion sort of thing. Um, but it wasn't, they couldn't make it, they just weren't interested in it, right? It just didn't fit what they needed in their day to days, right? So they would would mix cotton into linen, wool, silks, etc., cetera, uh, and use it that way. But the raw cotton um, shows up all over the place and has a lot, of, a lot of qualities to it that make it lend to fabric armor more than other fibers like wool or, or horsehair or 
linen toe or all the other things that they did use, but for body protection, they, they tended towards cotton, it seems. Yeah. Um, having made all these armors, I'm curious, how did the time commitments to make them compare to each other, particularly in the Aelid armor? Yeah, yeah. I'm wondering how that So, right, yeah. Um, so that guy was about 120 hours, give or take. Um, uh, Lua was about 120 hours, give or take. I expect the, the Charles VI would be the same. Rothball Jack would be very fast, maybe 50 hours, right? Um, the, I haven't finished my eyelid armor, right? But it goes, it goes faster than you would think. Um, but it, I figured, based off square footage, it's gonna take me about 10,000 eyelets to have the garment I want and I'm in about 90 seconds an eyelet, so <laughs> some time. I'm, just, I'm, I'm curious what the benefit of the eyelet armor is mm. compared to the it's other ones because it's so thin. That's my favorite thing for hunting. Eyelets are, like the buttonhole fish specifically, um, is used for buttonhole and eyelets are used for that because they prevent the fabric from tearing when mm -hmm. something would be pushed to the specific, which is why it's used for buttonhole. Yeah, mm -hmm. so eyelets, Anything that's trying to like go into it, like a board tuck, is going to get caught statistically in one of the holes, and it can't push that farther because it's a new force. So it's yep. almost well, I'm curious what you just said. Yeah, right? <laughs> uh, it'll cut. It'll, it'll cut, right? But a blunt object would have a harder time going through. Um, for me, it's going to be my base layer, so it's my under armor. It's wicking. It has holes, and that's what I want. Um, like, sort of going off of that, um, do you have an estimate, um, not necessarily trying to commercialize the interest, but right. if you were going to make one of these for somebody, what would you charge and feel paid adequately? <laughs> Apple what it should be. Ten grand. Yeah. <laughs> right? Well, I, yeah, I honestly don't know. Like, yeah. I mean, I can, what do you make an hour, 120 hours, right? You know, plus... It, like this one I had to have woven for me, and, oh, yeah. and so that was a grand just for the exterior yep. fabric, yep. right? Wow. So yeah, yeah, it, it adds up really fast if we're if we're paying living wages. Yep. Yeah. Um, but but that being said, it's probably important to mention that a lot of these, you know, I said you would you would construct a piece and then finish all of the pieces as pieces and then you put all the pieces together, yeah? A lot of that work can be done on the machine, mm -hmm. right? Anywhere a medieval person would have cheated, you can too. You can put it on your machine and get it done, right? So like the Charles the Six, you can totally do on a machine uh, with a zipper foot. I've tried it, it's really fast and easy because you're not trying to go through so much, so many layers. What kind of machine do you have? A, a fancy for Nina. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I, have a, I have a degree in uh, clothing design. That's why I've, the yeah. value of it is interesting to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but I mean, any any standard industrial machine would be able to handle it. Yep. Yeah. It's yeah. Like a couple layers of linen. It's only a few layers of linen, right? Yeah. Um, and you're and you need to butt it up against against uh, the the cotton roll, right? Yeah. And so that zipper foot. Yep. You pin it real tight, you get it real close, and then you run it yeah. just right on the inside of your pins. Yeah, they make and those um, leather machines that'll go through like oh, plywood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's for the sure. Term. <laughs> yeah, sail making machines too, by the way. Yep. But yeah, I saw you first. Um, do you have any thoughts on the reason for the linseed oil paint? Hmm? Oh yeah, yeah. So the linseed oil paint basically polymerizes, so it becomes like vinyl. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. Um, so, uh, some people have said maybe it's for waterproofing, which it kind of does, but I don't think that really matters. I think it's for abrasion resistance, right? Mm -hmm. You just made yourself a linen table or a, a vinyl tablecloth on the back, right? And it's just less likely to get, to get screwed up. Um, and, and you guys are, well, it's around, there's a sample around that you can feel. Um, but it, it really does, um, bind all of the individual fibers together. So even when it does get cut, it doesn't unfray. Sure. sure. Right? Yeah. Um, and related to that, I've been doing, that's what this guy is. I've been doing research on, uh, there are a couple um, references to fabrics 
four armor for, for proof doublets, whatever that means, um, being coated in some, some kind of gum or resin. So I've been screwing around with all different kinds of gums and resins because, of course, they don't tell us which ones or how, what quantities, right? Um, but I, it's pretty cool, um, and, and I'm getting some interesting results. Um, the one I haven't done yet, but is upcoming, um, it's mixing in rosin with gums. And I think that one's actually gonna work, because so far, they're not water resistant. When they get wet, it all kind of gets mushy. And so that's, I, I say that's a non-starter. So I haven't had success yet, but I found a new, I found a new source. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. Uh, a few more questions from the chats. We've talked a little bit already about uh, the sourcing of cotton and the preference, yay or nay, for wool. Yeah. Any other regional textiles that were preferred, say uh, Venetian silk, uh, Spanish cotton versus Levantine cotton, anything like that? I don't know anything about that. Uh, meaning I, I haven't seen that be referenced anywhere. Um, so that, unfortunately, isn't anything I could say much about. Especially because silk enters into Europe more so 15th, 16th century after the Ottomans have established uh, silk producing factories. Yeah. I mean, silk's so. around forever, but to like use it in the way that it got used uh, as armor elsewhere, I, it, that seems a hard sell. It was so expensive in Europe. Exactly. So. Before the market was flooded afterwards. Yeah. 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 Can you talk a little bit about each of these, uh, how they were used over armor, under armor, at just exclusively as armor, like metal? Where are they in relation to metal and that? I love it. That's a great question. Thank you. Uh, so the, the Lubeck Waffenrock, uh, when I wear it, which is, I think about how it was done uh, based off of paintings and such. Um, I have my arm and garment and my mail, my base, base layer mail, because I layer lots of layers of mail because I'm sick in the head. Um, <laughs> I, I know, it's so, it's so terrible. Anyways. <laughs> um, and then once I have my base layer of mail on, uh, then I go ahead and put on the Waffenrock. Then I have a mail apron that goes over the bottom part of the puff rock to protect the front, um, and then a breastplate on that, and then my arms and legs, right? Um, so it's kind of sandwiched in between some, some armor is under it and some armor is over it. Um, the coat armors, we see uh, based, on, based on examples out there uh, in paintings, that it could be either the breastplate was under it or over it, right? Uh, and likewise, male uh, for that would probably be under it because it's so thick, right? Um, something like the the blah, lots of people wear that as kind of their base layer. Um, so it's just enough to like give you protection from your mail. So probably armor would go over something like that. Again, not exactly that one because that's crazy amazing silk. So nobody was putting mail on top of that, right? Unless, probably nobody. Unless you're, you know. Unless you're Charles of Blois. That guy. <laughs> um, the Rothwell Jack, uh, I did mention, I think would probably be like the Lubeck, right? It would be kind of um, sandwiched in between. I suspect I had a breastplate. Again, whenever you see only one or two uh, places that it closed, you can kind of guess something, something went over that, whether it's mail or, or plate. Um, but as late as that is, I'm sure it's a plate. Um, and then the, the eyelet armor, I think, was a base layer, right? I think that's your base layer that would be under your mail. Um, and I'm experimenting uh, wearing mine with just my sports bra, right, under it. So I don't even have a linen shirt under it, so I'm getting, like, maximum, maximum breathability, and that's working really, really well for me. So, um, yeah, I'm getting, I have to wear that thing. I have seven pounds of cotton on me. I'm getting rid of every other layer I can. <laughs> yeah. So I, I want to ask a little bit about the fabric. I'm, I'm not like a sword person. I'm coming at this from like a textile industry thing. Awesome. Um, and one of the things that gets um, talked about in literature is like as spinning and weaving advancements improved in like loom manufacture and spinning material. Yeah, yeah. Um, there were drops in some of the quality of fabric that was being produced. For sure. And 
know you had to get the fabric, fabric woven specifically for that, but yeah. like, with your experience with the um, looking at the officials compared to like what fabrics are available today, and were you able to find stuff that is like similar to this and like hang to it, you know? Like, yeah. Density of thread? Yeah, it's really, really tricky. Particularly for like the heavier the the heavier weight linens that are just plain weave, mm -hmm. um, because like most of the most of the modern ones that I see um, seem to be how to say that seem to be many 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 smaller threads put through the same you know what I'm saying like yeah. a canvas or whatever right like it's not that actually spun it's yeah. yeah. Right? Do you, do you guys understand what I'm yeah. saying? I'm like trying to give technical and non-technical answers simultaneously. <laughs> um, but but uh, the originals weren't like that. They were just like woven with like yarn thickness linens, right? Yeah. So like like an eight one. Right. And this might not. This might be a technical question. Yeah. Do you have enough experience to know whether it was cow or lion? Uh, it was like. Okay. Usually like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they would keep the towel aside and for, use it for, for stuffing and, it's for yeah, it's so good for so many other things. Um, so yeah, no, it usually seemed to be a really nice light linen. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You just can't find that anymore. No, no, you can't. You guys, you can't get it like the old stuff. Let no, me tell you right no, now. No, no, no. You, you can't. They, they don't make linen thread like they used to. <laughs> no, they don't. Uh, I mean, they don't make sheep's wool like we used to, right? We don't have the same sheep anymore. Um, yeah. Um, a couple of years ago, a couple of us had the chance to look at a jack plate that was undergoing conservation at the BNA, and it Sweet. had separate cloth armor sleeves. Nice. Um, and I was curious, when does that start appearing? How common is that to have like detachable sleeves? Uh, separate sleeves. Your body? Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's a good question. I don't know, right? Um, because there just aren't. There, that's the only example I know of. Okay. That's okay. like that. Hmm. Um, not that there weren't other examples. And, and like one of the great questions when we look at imagery, right? Like very often, especially in the 15th century, like the sleeves and collars are a different color. And so then you get into the great debate is like that a Later vest version, over yeah. an undergarment or is that a multicolored single garment or, you know, and we don't, we don't really know. Um, if we go back, to where I had Charles Lynn on the right. Aha! So you see that guy over there on the left, um, you know, what's he wear? Right? Short shorts. Short, well, he's definitely wearing male booty shorts. Um, or is that a brand when you just pulled it all the way through? Uh, right? I mean, who knows, right? But so he has mail on his button crotch. Uh, he has male up top. Is that one garment? Is that two? Hard to know. Uh, along the bottom, is that fringe like was on the Waffenrock? Or is that padding that's sticking out from under a different garment? Hard to know, right? So we see this sort of thing come up all the time, and that makes it hard for me to give you an exact answer because we don't know what that, we don't know what that is, right? right? Um, but I would expect that having either detachable sleeves or sleeves that were attached to a separate garment worn underneath was common. Mm -hmm. I, I would expect. And, and that would make sense if you're dealing with different climates. Or mm -hmm. are, are well, you inside, outside in the winter and actually actively moving? Yeah, <laughs> and one of, the, one of the tricks of like, Tailoring a fighting garment is being able to move your arms, right? You guys, well, well, those of you that do swords have experienced this, right? Or, or anybody that's worn a modern cut suit, right? You can't, you can't, I mean, you can't lift it up the lift, right? But in fighting, you can't have that. Uh, you can't have this pinning you down. So, um, so having the sleeves be un, uh, unattached to uh, the part that can't move for armor purposes, um, is, is a way to get around that. Mm -hmm. So so I wouldn't be surprised if it existed pretty common. Yeah. yeah. A couple more questions from chats. Uh, 
how fast do a lot of these garments wear out before needing repair? And for any of your work or anything you've researched, has shellac ever been used as a fabric stiffener? Ooh, nice. Uh, I have not run into shellac. Uh, the closest so far is rosin, right? But but not shellac. Um, the exact difference, I can't tell you right now. One is in alcohol. Anyways, but yeah, I'm, I'm not so sure about that. Um, as far as repair, fabric armor is like other armor and you repair it all the time, non-stop. Um, I would rip my mic out if I went over there, but in a little bit we'll turn this garment around and you will see where my breastplate rubs against it and rubbed through it and I've had to you know, patch it with the cabbage of the fancy, you know, fancy fabric that I have a little precious baggie of, right? So I was able to patch it with its same fabric. But um, yeah, uh, my little my little dags, they get ripped off all the time. I have to re-sew them back on, like go across the fighting field, find them, pick them up, <laughs> take them home, put them back on, right? So, so repair is just part and parcel of a fighting garment. Um, I just, yeah. It makes it cooler though. Yeah. Okay. I did do it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I knew it would. Yes. A heroic gesture. So, a uh, couple of things. First of all, maybe you have no idea about this, but the, the eyelet armor looks like an enormous bag of neck, right? Is there any, uh, first of all, do you have an idea for how common it was? I'm not, I, mean, I haven't seen many, but if it's worn under everything else, I can see it as something that maybe was out there kind of a lot, and you just don't know about it. Right. Got, got rid of it. And my real question is, have you found any suggestion that there's a cottage industry around creating that? Because it seems like, you know, it's a chain dog kind of pain in the neck. Yeah. I mean, again, I don't know. I, the, the burn, excuse me, burn uh, museum example hints to me that there probably was some sort of industry of, of creating the fabric. Um, I haven't found it in any documentation. Nobody's written about it, as far as I know. Um, it's, it, it is a pain to do, but it's also not that big of a pain to do. Because um, again, it's tools. So I have, a, I have a huge embroidery frame, and so I lay my layers out on that, and it's just sitting like a table, and I watch Braveheart, or Lord of the Rings, or whatever I'm watching, right? And so I can just do 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 right? And so, you know, you can just drive your drive your all right through, you know, and stitch and just move to the next one. You're not having to knot, you're not having to move the threads. So, I mean, it actually goes pretty, pretty fast. Um, and it would be something that you could set a seven-year-old to doing, right? <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was the way to do it, yeah. Um, I was just curious, the, uh, the Livic Vathama is similar in line and seemingly in construction to the uh, uh, cordipi, so-called cordipes that we see in uh, uh, King Rene's Book of Love. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do, you, do you see any connections, uh, you know, a, a through line for all that? Or? Oh, I don't, I don't know if there's a through line. I think, I think there's... Uh, well, what I would say is the through line is, is the emphasis on small waist and hips that seemed really popular for a couple hundred years uh, for men until it goes away, right, um, in the 16th century. Um, and so I think, I think that, that's really it, is that, that everyone was seeking these lines to help emphasize a certain masculine disease. Well, I guess what I'm, what I'm getting at, though, is a little deeper than that, is oh, okay. that uh, I, I believe the time it's been too many years since I really was looking at that a lot, but I think yeah. that's like 1460s, 70s. Right. And uh, it's shown as a martial garment. I mean, they're, uh, they're certainly wearing it in the hunt. They're also in a melee. Uh, yeah, yeah. They're, they're wearing it. Sure. Uh, so it might be the ancestor to that, you know. Yeah. Or is it, you know, I had always thought it was more of a, civilian garment or you know more purely decorative not not a protective garment but right. this this makes me think no maybe it was yeah yeah oh i don't know i don't know that's a new thought to me so i'd have to like i have my copy of, of the book of love at home i'd have to like sit down with it and think of it from that perspective sure. um yeah i don't know that's a good question though
So just uh, off question from the uh, unrelated. You'd mentioned that Tasha's specialty is the Charles the Sixth uh, yeah. one. Yeah, and the Bois. She, yeah, she never got the Bois. I have her book on the Bois. Yeah, yeah. So does she have anything published on pattern and making the uh, Charles the Sixth one as well? As far as I know, she hasn't done a how-to. Okay. I would, I would, I would get her up for that. Yeah, I just rechecked her Lulu channel just to make sure, but. Yeah, no, know. I don't. I know she had planned on it. Okay. Um, but I don't know whatever happened to it. Yeah. Mm. Anatomy is a great thing that you show for today. Is cording, is that something yeah. that was always in the before, or that may have been? I think cording absolutely could have been. I'm just not aware of any examples that did use it. Okay. Right? Um, uh, certainly some of these some of these channels would have been easier to do using cords, right? Yeah. You could you could you could achieve the same aesthetic for sure. Uh, but no, as as far as I know, no. Now there's uh, the same Charles Lind. I mean, for real, look him up and look at what he's been up to. Uh, but he definitely uh, there, there's examples in in paintings of uh, hats, <laughs> like like little caps made out of thick rope that you could wear as an armor or with armor or whatever. And he's made a couple of those. So that's as close as I can get to to that same idea of it. Yeah. You mentioned you got custom fabrics for your piece there. What was the process to, I mean, do you go to, go to somebody with a bloom and a couple thousand hours of time? Or, or, <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. Okay. We're yeah. out there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're out there. They're it's out there. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, she got super pumped, uh, super pumped about it, just also being in the costuming world. Um, and, uh, and, and just got excited about the project I was working on and the things I was testing and the way I was going after it. And so, uh, yeah, I was able to, to beg her and plead with her. And she said, okay, yeah, me and my apprentices will do it. And, and so we got it done. Uh, but she, she's, she was fascinated with the weaving side. And um, I was able to find, um, not only to record what this exact uh, irregular twill was, but then to find it had been written about that it existed in lots of other garments, um, and was able to find like a like a pattern for it and the whole thing that had been documented. So I was able to give her a ton of research. So all she had to do was do the thing, right? But she was excited to do the thing because she hadn't seen it done. So, yeah. Um, what was her name? Like, did she have a? <laughs> <laughs> What's her number? <laughs> I will hook you up later. Okay. I will hook you up later. Yeah. I would also like to point out Minnesota has a Weavers Guild, and they're all nerds. We're all nerds. Everyone <laughs> over there is a nerd, and we also have a spinning group. Oh yeah, I've met, I've met some of you. So, <laughs> I, I, one of the people in the spinning group spins the thread that you use to make Shetland plate shawls, which are so fine that you can go through a wedding ring. So like, we're, I know the, I know some of these nerds. I know, I know all of these nerds. nerds. <laughs> but yeah, we have skill in Minnesota, just like shoot them an email and they'll just send it out to the listserv. Someone will take them up. I mean, I don't have the money. I can see that. We're nervous. Which I have. Excellent. Well, it's, we're running about an hour and 40 minutes plus. All right. So. Yeah. Well, excellent. Thank you all so very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. classes at Center for Blade Arts tomorrow and Sunday at 10 30, 1 30, and then you should email Brandon if you want to come. Yeah. Unless it's full. There are two spots. So if you <laughs> want to come in, uh, talk to me today, and I will uh, put your name down. Two spots is two spots. It's going to be a good time. If there's more than two, you got to fight out.